So we're on. We're starting, guys. I'm Natalie. Um, this is my first season here at the Femme de Quatre Temps. Um, I've been working on farms across Canada for about the past five years. Um, and yeah, so it's been a really great experience working on the farm this year. And I'm I need to be louder. Okay. <laughs> my name is Natalie. I work on the Femme de Quatre Temps. It's my first season uh, at this farm, but I've been working on farms across Canada for the past five years. Um, and I'm excited to talk about some of the tools that we've been using at the farm this year. Uh, my name is Ariane. So my first language is French, so sorry for the accent, but if you have questions, don't hesitate. Uh, it's my first season at La Ferme des Quatre Temps. I've been uh, farming for two years before going to the farm. And yeah, I'm going to kickstart the flower production next year on the farm. So I'm uh, Jean Martin, JM, and my first language is also French, so sorry about the accent. I know it's there sometime. And uh, we'll be presenting some of the new tools and equipment that we've been using on another farm project. But before we get to that, I still want to do somewhat of an intro to the work that I've been doing the last few years. And just to bring everybody along to where I'm at now, coming from where, and the reasons why we do the things the way we do them. So this is my home farm. It's been pretty well documented and featured. There's an online DVD that shows people how we work on this small parcel of land. It's an acre and a half of cultivated uh, permanent raised beds. Uh, there's 160 of them. And this is a, a farm that we bought. It was, a, it was an old rabbit barn. And we converted it to a house. And we've been farming this piece of land for 15 years now. And it's been just an awesome, rewarding uh, life because we, get, we got my wife and I, Modelen, she's at the conference. She left for the city today, but you can meet her. Um, we've been able to raise our kids in the countryside, build our house. We've been involved in our community directly selling uh, vegetables to them and just getting the benefit of being a food producer too in that community and just being able to live on the farm in the countryside and living a quite happy life, I would say, and having fun building all of this over the years. That was really um, what got us into this. Uh, the claims, earlier claims that I was making a lot were that you can make 100K per acres. That seems to be like old news now because some growers are pushing this limit way beyond. But when I started to talk about this, it was pretty new into a lot of the circles. And it was, it was just kind of the push, the idea that the farm doesn't need to be big to be productive and profitable. And you know, you really see how small this farm is, but it employs four people full time for a big part of the year, and it feeds more than 250 families. Okay, so that's the makeup of the farm. Uh, a big part of our success in this project, in us learning how to become better growers, and us not jumping on board in this idea of scaling up and mechanizing our farm and our farming system was because of the tools that we had and um, that are very appropriate for what we do in the market garden. And a big part of our success is directly linked to the tools that we've used in the past and that we're still kind of coming up with. Um, the financial success of my farm is linked to the low startup cost and the fact that the farm is small you can either rent it or if you're buying you're not buying a hundred acre and the equipment that you need to get going is very low tech um, when we started for around 40k we pretty much had all the equipment that we needed to get going for, for uh, 40k might sound like a lot of money for, for young people that are starting out, but if you have a loan at 10%, uh, this would be the worst case scenario over five years, that's a, that's a pretty decent payback if you're aiming or getting to results of around 100K per acre. 
So all of this to say that this is digestible, but always to keep in mind that in this farm model, which is, you know, I, I called a market garden and a market farm, they're very different. Uh, the tool shed needs to stay simple and uh, sophisticated, but not expensive. And that's where the word appropriate technology, I really f uh, find, uh, finds its meaning. One of our biggest influence was uh, an early visit to Cuba. And I always like to remind people of that because when we visited Cuba, that was before um, we started this farm. And we had studied how when the Soviet Union fell apart, uh, Cuba had to reinvent their whole farming to be 100% organic. And they came up with a system of organoponicos, which are permanent raised beds of densely seeded crops. And why this was relevant for us is because we would see acres and acres and acres of non-tractor-based farm setups, highly productive. And people that were farming were actually you know, gardeners. And they were, they were growing stuff intensively and feeding the whole island this way. So that was, for me, an insight into, OK, this kind of model of permanent beds, non-tractorized, can really be scaled up. We also did a lot of trips to Europe earlier on and saw a lot of people that were farming with tools that we didn't know existed. Uh, at that point, the rotor tiller was our main tool. And we met a lot of growers from France that talked to us about how to be more gentle with the soil, how to make sure that you're not compacting it, breaking the crust, the, the structure every time. So got influenced by this. And that uh, was one of the reasons why we went with a 30-inch bed system. And in our farms, the alleyways are 18, which is a very important uh, difference from when we're in the greenhouse. Uh, because we're standardizing the permanent beds, you know, the standard becomes important. And I highly recommend people adopt this 30-inch uh, uh, bed strategy. Uh, the reason is most of the tools that are on the market and that were on the market when we started are standardized to do the work either on 30-inch or the tools are 15-inch to do the, the work in two pass. And so, so that makes a big difference. The reason why most of these tools are standardized to 30-inch is because of Elliot, who's in the room right now. Elliot wrote the New Organic Grower. That was the first uh, farming book that I read when I got interested into farming. Uh, it was the most influential. I probably read it 30 times. I was trying to figure out how Elliot was doing stuff on his farm. And through the yearly uh, Johnny's catalog that we would get every year, we would see some of the new tools that were there. And everything was always making more and more and more sense with this concept of 30-inch bed systems. So we owe Elliot a lot and the, the folks at Johnny's for the evolution of this. A lot of these tools were brought by him from Europe or built here uh, with the inspirations of some of the growers back there. And uh, perhaps later on in this uh, workshop, Elliot can give us a few words about what he thinks the tool business and the tool strategies are going up next. A big part of the reason why we don't have a tractor on our farm is, first of all, we didn't have a lot of space. And tractors, just to turn at the end of hedgerows, they do eat up a lot of growing area. But also because when most growers use tractors, it's either they're plowing and hilling and shaping soil, which tractors are really made for. But in a permanent bed system, you really don't need that. Because once you make your beds, then you're just kind of rolling with that every year and you're working the surface. Perhaps you're reshaping beds every other year, but you're definitely not plowing and, and reshaping soil at a large level. But also, tractors become very uh, you know, customized because they have one or two weeding implements, cultivating implements, and then all the spacings between the crops get determined by the weeding implements. And then you're either growing carrots or lettuce or potatoes, and it's all the same uh, standardized dimension between crops, and it's not optimal for space and yield. In a market garden, the strategy 
is to pack as much vegetable in, one of, in your growing area, you know, finding the right balance between yield, quality, and, and caliber, you know, to have the right size. And once you adopt this kind of strategy, what you see is that the bed gets to be covered by the leaf of the plant that you're growing, shading out the weed and retaining the moisture, which is, which is beneficial for the soil, uh, biology, and for the plant itself. So I've given hundreds of workshops about all of that, and I think if you are new to these things, you can, there's a lot of them online, and you can revisit that, but it's, these are the fundamentals to, to keep in mind why we use 30-inch beds um, and why we are into minimal tillage practices is very important. And so this is, this is the image that talks about this. We are putting crops really close to one another in a 30-inch bed, and we get the benefit of the canopy, which, again, shades out the weeds and retains the moisture, which is really important for all of the microbial life. But if you want vegetables to be able to shoot down, you need to have root systems that can penetrate the soil, and you need to have soil structure that allows that. And what we've found over the years with our systems, and what I'm advocating is to replace mechanical tillage with biological tillage, and having the earthworms and other creatures do that work for you. And so all, all of the tools that we use uh, in my farming systems are all geared towards that goal of not destroying the soil structure, the habitat of the earthworms, because you want to rely on these guys to create soil structure that is really deep and loose so that your root systems can shoot down and then you have super healthy crops. So I'm going pretty fast with all of this, but I always think it's important for people to reconnect with that because this fundamental point of view influences the whole game plan of how we work or not work the soil and some of the strategies that we use to, in that regard. Another picture from my book really explains why there's a lot of efficiencies built into this way of doing things. When you compare row cultivating, which is done really fast with a tractor, but when it's time to put row covers or insect nets, and you're covering five rows of carrots on five or six feet compared to 30 inch, well, you need a row cover that is five times the size, which is five times more expensive, and it takes five times more effort to put on than just ganging every, every, everything closer and benefiting from that, if the efficiency there. So these are some of the fundamentals of the market garden. And a lot of people that are succeeding in this model keep this in mind. A lot of people uh, from more of a mechanized perspective look at this and they don't really understand how it's possible to be efficient in the market garden. But you know, that is one example that really shows the difference. Uh, spacings, I've worked with a lot of spacings through the years. Um, still playing somewhat with them, but you know the goal is to get quality, caliber, and yields. Okay, so that's what you want, and you're working in a system where 30 inch is the standard. That really helps because if we were all working on different bed width, then it'd be very much more difficult to compare information between everyone. Now we're all working on 30 inch. And it just, it just simplifies the task of figuring out what, which are the best spacings. Some of the tools that we've adopted from the get-go are geared toward this idea of working with living soils and not harming the uh, ecology in the beds. And so the broad fork is the number one. And that's why my farm is called the broad fork farm in French, La Grelinette. Um, you really see how that flows. The rotor tiller, the reason why we left rotor tiller out is because when you have soil that has really nice aggregates and you put it in the tiller, you pulverize all these aggregates into finer particles. And what happens is that at first it looks really loose and deep, but if you come back a week later, 
it's going to start to compact. There's no way around that because there's no more aggregates in the soil. So we uh, moved away from that and introduced this concept of power harrows. Uh, probably uh, I was one of the first ones to really talk about this tool and explain to growers why this tool is superior. It's perhaps a bit more expensive, but it's definitely less harmful with the earthworms. You can really work only on the surface. You're not bringing weed seeds from the bottom up and you're not harming the ecology of your soil. Tarps was another big game changer for us in my farming system. Uh, using tarps to clear out the beds uh, without tilling them, you just need to cover them and the absence of light will uh, destroy the weeds or the residues that are there. It's actually creating also an environment where the earthworms feel that they can come up, they won't get eaten by the bird, the plastic is black, you're tricking them thinking it's nighttime, and they come up and they take the organic material that's there and they're bringing it down. And so you're preparing your soil but you're also feeding your soil web and you're getting rid of the dormant weed seeds if you're leaving the tarp long enough. So all of this was really covered in my book and, and, and in my farm. And again, these were the, the first tools that we used, the six row cedar, and the, the other seeders uh, cultivating crops with uh, stirrup hose um, and just doing the basics in a low tech system, nothing fancy. Uh, wheel hose are awesome. And so that's what we've been doing for all these years. Uh, over the course of time, we also started to work with different strategies. The flame weeder using that tool uh, in pre-emergence for the carrots, preparing beds prior, popping the weeds, and, and seeding prior to that, and then using the flame weeder just before the carrots are ready to emerge, and then you know, taking the problem of cultivating dirty carrot beds almost out entirely by just the way you prepare things prior to your planting. Um, we've used a lot of also clear plastic, especially to prepare our first seedlings in the spring. And the strategy there is you have your permanent beds and you are raising them, preparing them in the fall. Then we'll put clear plastic on these beds and we'll warm them up in the fall. A lot of the weeds will grow under those conditions because the clear plastic really warms up the soil big time. And then we're putting black tarps over those clear plastic for the winter, covering the garden plot, uh, making sure that it won't get eroded. But also the, the black plastic kills all the weeds because of the absence of light. It will melt the snow faster in the spring. And then you remove the black tarp and you have clear plastic that is warming up the soil and really fast in March. And then when you remove the clear plastic, you have weed-free, hot, dry soil that is ready to be planted in. And in our climate, which is a bit cooler than here, you know, our first seedlings are end of March using these strategies in soil that is warm enough to germinate and to uh, have the crops grow well. Then we'll cover everything with row covers, caterpillar tunnels, mini tunnels, the whole thing, but this is a pretty good strategy. So you see that here. Okay, fast forward to where we're at now. And this is La Ferme des Quatre Tins. It's a very different project from my own farm. It was actually <coughs> Elliot that introduced me to the owner of this farm, Mr. Desmarais, that wanted to create a farm that could be um, an, an opportunity to showcase different ways of doing things in farming. Uh, highly influenced from the stone barns and, 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 and what's going on here. And so Elliot was helping in this project. I came along and I, I was hired to do a lot of the design and I've been working on this project for the last three years now. So three full seasons. Uh, it's a massive undertaking. The farm has 450 permanent raised beds 
and um, we'll show some of that. It has 160 acres. It has uh, livestock. It has pigs that are in the forest. It has poultry that are in eggmobiles that are you know, running after the, the cows in the fields surrounding an eight acre market garden which has a lot of neat stuff uh, incorporated into the design of the garden. And today I don't have time to go in the flowering hedgerows that we've put and all of the biodiversity that we're bringing back into the garden with using different permaculture design principles. We're going to stick to more of the production side, but perhaps at another time or this afternoon I can go in detail. So the garden is really big and the reason why this garden is so big is because I wanted to create a training ground for people to learn how to become really good market growers, market gardeners. And so, and I know from experience that the clutch factor is being able to do well under a lot of pressure and to be efficient. And I wanted this garden to be big enough so that a crew of 10, which is what, how many people I wanted to train, would feel the pressure of a lot of production. So the garden is sized so that it's big enough so that there's so much work that we feel the need to be in a hurry and to have a really efficient flow and system. Okay, because I know that I call this the fifth gear. If you're a young grower and you're starting your own farm, you need to be really comfortable driving in the fifth gear because that's how fast you need to go in the first years. Eventually, when your systems kind of settle down, you can shift down to the fourth, and eventually, if you're good, you can shift down to the third gear, but the fifth gear is really important, okay? So, chicken, eggmobiles, and then uh, porks, and so we're not gonna talk about that, that today, mostly about the acre market garden, but one of the challenge when, when I was designing this farm was how to run it and find the right tools and equipment for us to be really, really efficient. And um, five of those tools we're going to be presenting to you today. Okay? So Nathalie and Ariane will share some of those with you guys, and then I'll come back and, and talk about some of the new ones and answer questions, and then we'll take it from there. Uh, any questions before we go on and talk about these five tools specifically? Yep. Um, you mentioned the flame reader. I've, I've always been concerned about using that. What kind of effect does that have on the soil and the earthworms? Yeah. Underneath? For all these years that I've been using it, I haven't seen any effect. And the reason is you're not really burning the soil. You're just creating a thermal shock to the weed because it's just, it's just getting a shock and then the cells burst and then the plant die. So you're actually going really fast and you're not really burning the soil. And a lot of people ask me the same question about using tarps. You know, tarps, a black tarp, it's like putting straw. It's mulching the garden and just creating a good environment for the soil web. So I don't think it creates any harmful effects. Yes? Um, do you find that power, power harrow is um, more delicate on rocky soil than like a normal tiller? For no, I think it's less delicate. Okay? Because on rocky soil, on a rotor tiller, when you hit a big rock, you really, <coughs> it explodes. Um, the trick is to take some of the time to take some of the rocks out. And then you don't want to be working below four inch. And I, ideally, you'd be working in the first inch or two inch. And, you know, I could come back at another conference and gives you, give you a lot of tricks on how we cheat the no-till systems using our tools, raising beds higher, and then working, you know, the inch that we just raised. There's a lot of strategies there, but uh, to answer, so the harrow is really good for, for rocks. Yes? If you use tools and strategies, how do you fit in things like cover crops? Um, none of those tools are geared towards cover crop. Um, if you go, uh, if you read The Market Gardener, if you go on YouTube, there's a lot of details about how we deal with cover crops using permanent beds, uh, harrows, tarps, and uh, plows. So I'm not going to go in detail into that today. 
Yes. With the tarps, how many people do you need to move them around, bring them over the beds, clean them? What's that labor look like? So tarps are labor to move around. But once, if you consider that once it's there, it's doing all the work for you, we figured out that two people can handle a 25 by 100 foot tarp really well. Um, and that's why the size of the bed, the blocks in this farm, are, it's, it, the field blocks are 10 beds of 100 feet because they fit in really nice with two of these 25 feet tarps. And we actually leave the tarps on the side of each field block now with all the sandbags there handy to put row covers and insect netting. So everything is made to be really efficient that way. Yes? Was your one and a half acre farm all grass when you got it? Yeah, it was all grass. Was it mostly all tarps? Or it was um, the, you know, when we started the farm, I didn't know all that I know today. It was a big voyage to discovering all of these tools and strategies, but we had it plowed and disked. And then I shaped all the beds using a shovel. It took about three weeks. Um, and then later on, we discovered the usage of tarps and all of that. But initially, we just kind of plowed and disked and then built the beds and put a lot of compost the first five years, really raising the organic matter in the soil. Again, we're not covering this today, but I could, I could talk forever about how to start the market garden and creating biology in your soil. Mm -hmm. Good. All right. So you have questions there. Yeah. So the reason why in Cuba they had concrete around their beds, there's two reasons. The first one is because they're trying to retain the moisture inside their soils because it's a it's a really hot climate. And the other reason is because they had to put people to work. So they put, and they had a lot of cement. And so they just built these beds, had all, you know, they did massive projects of people making these beds. Um, for, for them, at that point in time, cement was a commodity that they had a lot on. So I'm going to pass the mic to Nathalie. And she's going to talk about the biodisc and the flextine weeder. And uh, yeah, we'll take it from there. Um, so I was uh, the member of the team responsible for weeding on the farm this year, and that was a really fun job because we got some cool tools um, to use. So the first one that I want to talk about is this bio disc from TerraTech. So um, it's a double wheel hoe. Um, so it's sort of like a traditional wheel hoe, but you have these two wheels that straddle the crop on either side. Um, so it's more stable, which is nice. And then you also have here this um, modifiable toolbar. So it's just like a simple metal bar um, and you have a few different tools that you can add on to it. Um, so the one that we're talking about today is the bio disc but there's also a few different things like there's a finger weeder, there's a collinear hoe that pass on both sides, um, there's a tine harrow, there's stirrup hose, there's a few other things. Um, but this one here, it's a bio disc. Um, so it's these two discs that pass on either side of the crop and it sort of hills and it disturbs the small weeds at the same time. Um, so we have a little, yeah, that's a close up. Um, and then we have, oh yeah. So it mounds up um, about two inches of soil on both sides of the plant. So you do one pass and it does the crop at the same time. Um, it buries the little weeds that are there um, and they're disturbed enough that they don't grow back. Um, and it's just, so much faster than passing with a stirrup hoe or any other sort of, sort of hoax. You're doing it with a wheel, yeah. Do you find you have to space a little bit more? <sighs> What's, um, I think you can see here, these are adjustable on the, I don't know if you can tell. So it's like, you can adjust a little bit where they're placed. Um, and so because we're doing different crops with it, like we're doing leeks and onions, but we're also doing like little beets. And so those have, uh, leaves that are going on either side. So those ones, we were spacing these guys a little bit further apart, um, but it ended up still being really effective. Um, so we have a little video of how it works here. There's Jam using it. Just 
Can we have sound? There's a slow-mo version, very nice. Uh, most of the crops are six rows on 30 inch uh, that we use this. This is the tightest that we do with the bio disc, six rows on 30 inch. <laughs> no, it's awesome. <laughs> what do you feel it does with rocks? I don't know how your soil oh, is up there. Yeah, so it was a little trickier, I feel like, when it's a rocky soil. We did, as we were saying, sort of, we put a lot of time in this year on a pretty rocky soil to removing rocks. So that was sort of like a process that we went into because we're really working on uh, these kind of precision tools. Rocks get in the way of a lot of those. Um, so it's definitely more challenging um, when you have rocks or when you have like wet soil, for sure. Um, but it's definitely still possible, I found. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a pretty um, light tool. Um, so I didn't find. I mean, I'm not super tall, so I don't know if any tall people had a big trouble with it. But it's pretty easy to use, I find, and because it is the double wheels you're not having that sort of like stability issue that also I think contributes to the rock thing. Like you're not getting knocked off course too often. There's one other, yeah. Is this the first cultivation you're doing on these crops? Um, so it depends. Um, for, we have a little um, calendar later, but for example, for these carrots, um, it is, we do the flame weeding when they're seeded, but it is the first, um, sort of cult mechanical cultivation that we're doing and it's really effective. And then a week later for the carrots, we're gonna go in and hand weed, but we're just gonna be doing what's in the row rather than the whole thing. And we're not using stirrupos or, or any of that. So it's just so much faster than, cause we do a lot of carrots, it's a lot faster than going through with, the, with any sort of hand hoe. Wondering like with something you have to wait till it gets to yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We're using it a lot on transplanted crops, so you do have the, a bit less, you know, times so we're able to get in there faster, um, which is really nice. Were there other questions about this one? Are the wheels, the wheel width adjustable? The wheel width isn't adjustable, I don't think. No. It's, no. it's set, so it is sort of one of those things that f is really working for us for the 30 inch beds on that six inch spacing. Um, so it might, yeah, be modifiable, sorry. Do you find that you would like additional height clearance as well? Or is most of like the crops set and shading out weeds by the time that they'd be tall, too tall? I think it could be, what I found it could be interesting for is stuff like leeks, because we're, we were using it multiple times and it's a really nice hilling, to, like a hand hilling tool. That was the kind of thing where I found it could have been interesting to have a little more height for sure, which it doesn't have right now, but yeah, I think that would be cool to think about. Okay, awesome. Did you have a question? I was just gonna ask if you consider with drip and all, if you can yeah, most of our stuff is on like a overhead sprinkler, you know, a wobbler sprinkler system um, for that reason, because we are doing like lots of cultivation in the row, um, it ends up being easier. Um, but I think like anything, you would be moving it out of the way in order to cultivate. I don't think you could work around that. Yeah. Yeah. How have you found using it on less than prime Um, Because we're working in like a, a nice fluffy soil that we've done all of those things in order to, to create, that's really where I've used it. Um, so I don't know on a super compacted soil what the experience would be like, I think it would be. We also yeah. have the worst rocky soil imaginable. Mm -hmm. like, and, it, and it works. It works yeah. So. yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you guys have clay? I'm just curious how it works with clay. Even if the clay yeah. Is we do have some heavier parts for sure, but nothing that would be described as like a heavy clay. Is there anything else? Yeah. yeah. Do you have any problem with crusting on, on your soil? You know, in the early spring, you get that kind of stuff happening? Yeah, I, we don't have a huge problem with it, um, or at least in the past year, because we, I think with the, with the tarping, because we're not disturbing it too much, 
um, we find that the life is there, that it, it isn't um, too crusty, but also like I've just been at this farm this year and we had an incredibly wet year. And so <laughs> cresting really wasn't our, our issue this year. It was more just like soggy fields everywhere, which is its own issue. Um, so the other tool that we wanted to talk about is the flex tine weeder. Um, so you're going to see a picture of Jim using it here. So it's a really light um, tool that can be used for blind weeding. Um, so we use it to make a first pass over beds um, and to take out any weeds that are at the white thread stage. So little broadleafed weeds is really where it's most effective. Um, but in that case, we found it was super, super effective. So we at the farm do um, one block of uh, 10 hundred foot beds every week of direct seeded brassicas. So we do radishes, hackrai turnips, arugula, mustard, and mini kale. So we do a whole block of that every week. So that's a lot of little direct seeded stuff that we need to get in there and weed quickly. And so in that rotation, 12 days after those were direct seeded, Every week I would go with this tool um, and just do two really quick passes across those beds. So you do it at the moment when the seedlings are well enough established that they're going to hold on, but the small broadleafed weeds are going to be knocked out by this little tool. Um, so we have a little, oh yeah. So we are also using it on transplanted, some transplanted crops, it works better than others. Um, but really all it's doing is just going along and scratching the surface. So it's, it's not super complicated, but it's enough to disturb any of those smaller weeds. Um, and you're just doing it directly over your crop and it's, it's light enough that it's sort of moving around those. Um, and we were doing, depending on, on the crop, one or two passes over it and that was enough to disturb things um, successfully. So we have a little video here of it. We sort of systematized it in terms of timing because we were doing all those brassicas, so they was sort of the first true leaf stage. That was the timing. It doesn't just cut up your grain? No, because it is, it is light enough. So you can see here these are um, little lettuces, which we obviously wouldn't want to be disturbed, but it's just passing over lightly enough that it's not damaging the leaves or anything. Isn't this awesome? Yeah. <laughs> this is fucking cool. It's so cool. <laughs> How much is that? Um, we have on your handout, I did want to include the prices of stuff because I think it's super important to know. Like, I think this is a super effective tool and it really is reducing the amount of time and labor that you're using, but it is, like, it's not cheap. And so I think it is that kind of cost decision that you'd make if you're a small farm starting how much, is this going to save you enough labor to, to make that? Yeah, I think you had a question first. So how long would it take you to just run through one of your blocks? It was super fast. So because on those brassica crops we're using insect netting, oh, yeah. um, taking that on and off was like by far the most time costly part of it. But to go back and forth, it really, like on one bed, it takes like two and a half minutes. So I would spend probably an hour, an hour and a half each week doing this um, on a block or two. And so it's really a very quick and effective tool. Thanks. Yeah. Not for everything, just for the carrots, because they're such a tricky, weedy crop. Um, but for the rest of them, we're using the tarps um, for most of it. But the yeah. next slide. <coughs> Yeah, so this is probably helpful to look at. So this isn't all of our crops, but we did want to show sort of our weeding schedule for these big ones that we're working on systematizing. So because we're a big team. <laughs> wow, you're popular. Because we're a big team and we're really working, as Ariane is going to sort of explain, to systematize these crops that we're doing, we've worked on setting up this calendar for weeding. Um, so as much as I'm going around and observing where the weeds are bad, we're also looking to plan ahead and know where we're going to have things to do. So you can see that um, I can go through that it's, I guess, just for 
the big crops. So we're using the stale seed bed technique for the carrots, um, and then we're using the flame weeding right after they're seeded. Um, that flex time weeder that we just showed, um, we're using for that block that I was talking about, we're using it 10 to 12 days after seeding, and then once again a week later. So that's sort of the limit point when uh, stuff gets a little too big to use it on. Um, but that was the only weeding that we're doing on those crops. Um, and then we're also using it on some of these transplanted crops like fennel, coriander, green onions, kohlrabi, and finding it was really effective on that. Um, the bio discs you can see we're using on the beets um, 12 days after they're transplanted. So that's sort of, they're established enough to not get knocked down um, and the weeds are ready to be taken out. Um, and that was sort of what we were talking about, the, that limit point for the carrots um, when they're big enough to use it on was about 21 days after seeding. Um, and we used it often on some of the, these transplanted crops, so fennel and green onions as well. Yeah. I think you're. <laughs> I think you're very lucky. <laughs> I'm, I'm just, what happens? Or maybe it's happening, and I'm just naive. And I think I'm getting growth. Or it. no, I think if you haven't had to weed your carrots, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the thing about weeds also is never forget that if you let them go to seed, then you're multiplying your problem by hundreds of thousands of times. And so the strategy is to never let weeds to that stage where they're, they're seeding. And so that's why we're always preventing them. Um, because at one point, if you never take care of weeds, then they'll take over. And then when you seed, you can't work your plants anymore. Mm -hmm. Can you say again, what, what was stale seed bed? <coughs> can you explain that better than I can? Stale seed bed is that you are preparing your beds prior to your seeding or transplanting date, and you're popping up the weeds by watering them or putting row cover and when, when the weeds are popped, then you destroy them, and then you seed or then you transplant. Usually we use a flame weeder for that or the harrow, but you obviously don't want to use the rotor tiller to do that because then you're bringing new weeds seeds from the bottom up. So what's the one week? Is that? So then one week before your seeding date, let's say we're seeding on the 3rd of August, then one week later we prepare the carrot beds and we water them, we put row cover, or clear plastic, whatever, to pop up the weeds. And, and then we'll seed the carrots without working the beds. And when we're using the flame weeder, what we do is then we seed the carrots, and then there's another five to seven days before the carrots emerge, and then the weeds are there. And then you're using your flame weeder, destroying all the weeds, and then the carrots are emerging in weed-free soils. That's why you're doing it 10 days earlier because yeah. you want to give time for those weeks to yes. pop up so when you come with the exactly. flavor, you're actually getting so, something. Because I was like, why don't you just do it the day before? And yeah. Have it nice the whole strategies that, that Natalie is describing and the tools is for weed prevention. Okay, that's really what we're aiming at here. Um, do you, you guys use the paper pot transponder? We're going to discuss it later. We're not using it right now because in, in Canada, the organic system doesn't accept it, okay. but we will. I was going to ask if it <coughs> Yeah. That's a good question. Uh, I wanted to know if, like, okay. is heavy rainfall Absolutely. So this is, like, in the ideal world, and it's not what actually happens, I think, like anything. Then we're, then we're waiting, that, that is definitely the case. This year, we, as I was saying, we had a really wet year, so we were certainly having to delay stuff, and that does affect, because really all of these tools are to get stuff at the earliest possible stage in order to be most effective, so that was often the case, where we were having to delay things, and then weeds are out of control, and yeah. So this is like the perfect world that doesn't exist. Yeah. Um, and then, as you can see here in the carrots, we're hand weeding in the row, as I was saying, after that pass. But it really is minimizing, because maybe except for you, I've spent a lot of time 
hand weeding, hand weeding huge beds of carrots that take a really long time. So this was really minimizing that sort of time. Um, so I think now I'm going to pass you on to Ariane, unless anyone had any questions about those tools. We can also come back later about questions. Yeah. OK, let's see. OK, so to wash all our greens, we use the bubbler. So the bubbler is a stainless steel um, tub with some PVC pipes attached to a jacuzzi pump. And it's based on Michael uh, Kilpatrick's uh, plan. And he has a website called The Bubbler. So before we used The Bubbler, we were like uh, washing our greens in bats. So it was like pouring like the greens in one bat and then another and then tri sometimes triple washing them. So with The Bubbler, it's only a single washing process. So it's really time efficient. Um, and it's, it streamlines our process by letting us wash, dry, and bag up 100 pounds per hour of our uh, mesclun mix. And it's really, like in the core of the season, we do up to 200 pounds. So to have the bubbler is really nice. And we can put up to 10 bins in our 500 gallons um, bat, uh, 10 bins of three kilos of greens. And then we scoop the greens with um, orange um, baskets and put them in our modified spinning machines. So I can, this is specs from Michael Kilpatrick's website where he shows you how to build your own bubbler. And also what is nice is that he has uh, spreadsheets with parts lists. Um, so he gives you all the name, the name of the parts and then the link and the price. So the average cost for all the, um, all the parts is $330 and a tank is maybe $550. And what is really nice with the bubbler is that it really does a thorough wash of all your greens. So everything is super clean. Here is a. Do you always do greens in there? Do you do anything else? Yes. Uh, sometimes we will wash our peppers. Yeah. Do you need to change the water out or no? Uh, yes, so we do, like when we see that the water becomes pretty like dirty, we do empty it out. Um, that does take a little bit of time and we want to work on something that's uh, faster to drain the water out. Obviously it depends on the, how dirty the first, but how many pounds of um, mix are you doing before you feel like you have to change the water? Mm. It depends. Yeah. yeah, it really depends on like, have you been harvesting in the like rain, once, like, or... Multiple times a day, like, you know, like, do you have to do it? Maybe two to three times uh, we will change the water during a harvest day. Yeah. yeah. And then you see the water bringing out. Yeah. Do you have any question on the bubble? Yes. Yeah, do you keep cleaning out the system once you're done using it? Uh, so we clean the bat with, like, we have hoses and we just, like, wash it down and then stainless steel is super easy to wash, so it really cleans up fast, yeah. No. We haven't so far. Yeah. We sanitize the, the bubbler mm -hmm. with Sanidate before we put the greens in. Um, I know that some people take it out. I think Michael Kilpatrick tells you to do that. Um, we're trying <laughs> to cut corners as much as we, we can. We might have to change this perspective, but for the time being, we're just kind of. Does this water go anywhere? Do you have like a catchment system or do you filter it back in to ease the water again? 
we do not currently have a, a system like that, no. but it could be a yeah, good idea. Uh, do you use uh, white PVC or gray? White. White. And you don't want to put glue because you want to be able to open them to wash them, if anything. Okay. Yeah, so all the part lists, all the material, mm -hmm. all the know-how is in Michael Kilpatrick's, yeah. I think it's the, $20. So it's here's a, it's the, an online tutorial. The website, if you want to learn how to build your bubbler. And he has different sizes, like 40, 100, and 150 gallon uh, bubblers. Any more questions or? Do you guys cool down your water, like ice at all? Or no, our, our water comes out. Pretty cold. Cold, yeah. <laughs> um, Is that your only one on the farm? Yep. Yeah. And it's about like uh, a minute to wash the, um, the meston mix, but for maybe arugula or like spinach, you need to be careful because it bruises very easily. So sometimes. Okay you have to put them like maybe 30 seconds and then you put it off or even like no bubbling effect for like arugula because it bruises so easily so yeah Pass à l'autre arrière. so that's michael with his modified spinning machine that we uh, use on the farm we have th uh, four uh, of the spinning machine. Okay, crop lining. So uh, one of the reasons why we can work on the fifth gear on the farm is because we really have a solid plan. Um, so we really take the time after the season in November to sit uh, everyone together and just uh, go over crop by crop, uh, what worked, what did not work, and what we want to do um, for the next season. And it's really important to have everyone's input and also to have everyone on board for um, next season. And so we go over crop by crop and we see how many beds do we want to seed, uh, how many successions we want. Um, and then we use Excel spreadsheets to um, have like a transplant calendar where you have like all your info, so your crop, your variety, your seeding date, uh, how many days in the nursery, um, the day to maturity. Um, and so the person in charge of the nursery has all the dates uh, that she needs to start her trays and when it needs to go out in the field. And also like implantation notes, like where does it need like netting or... And we also have a direct seeding calendar. So same thing. And also the task. Are these available somewhere? So it is available <laughs> at the Market Gardeners Masterclass. Uh, which just launched, so yeah, um, they are available. But you know, like there's a lot of seeding calendar out there in, on the internet that you can uh, customize for your needs. We also have a task calendar. So for every um, crop, what needs to be done like the bio disc and the peng. <laughs> so this, I uh, would say, is the most important like tool that we have. Uh, we customize our fill plan um, on Excel. And it's really an overview of our field. So that's the north field. And when we have decided on the crop, the number of beds and the successions and the dates, we need to make sure that everything fits. And is, it's not a, an easy task, um, but this is really a good tool like, to make sure that we start the season with a solid plan and that we know that everything you know, is, is there and 
we are ready to go. Can you explain it just a little bit? Yes. I see a lot of blocks and colors. <laughs> yeah, so each crop has a color. And then we put um, the crop name and the date. And then we start um, placing the crop on the first row of the north field because the north field is on the slope. So it dries up uh, quicker in spring. So we start planting on top and then we like go down. And here you have like uh, the months here. And so, for example, we, um, the garlic will be there. So we planted the garlic in fall and then we will have the garlic in the bed until we harvest it in like July. So N forty uh, like the N twenty six and thirty six is a block. So each block has ten beds, and then we like no carrots will occupy six beds of out of the ten. Yeah. And what's nice is that um, here is just to show you that the blocks we can move them and just really arrange it so that everything fits. So every date in our seeding calendar has a block mm -hmm. color. And then we have, because the farm is so big, we'll have 400 of these seedlings. Then we need to double and triple crop per field block per bed. So to manage all this complexity, we have this visual template that we can work with, which also becomes a, a guideline when we go into the fields. Ariane will go into the field and she'll have the map of where things are, where things are going next, and that helps to kind of deal with all this complexity that we have in the field. Do you have suggestions on when you start from the farmer's on how to staff appropriately with, without losing money? I'll answer your question after our presentation. Yeah. Okay. So we are moving towards an application <coughs> called TEND. So maybe you have met the guys of TEND. They're here uh, at Stone Barns. Um, so it's a crop planning program. And it's very interesting because it regroups all your information into one place. And it syncs all the data that's been entered by the crew member. Um, and the main reasons why we want to um, uh, include TEND in a workflow is because there's a fill map. So a little bit like we do on Excel. Uh, you can see like a Google map of your fields. And then if you click on a block, you can see uh, which crop you have there currently, what's coming next. And it gives you a really quick overview <coughs> of your field. And it's really nice for like the harvest manager to just um, have a view in a few minutes of what's ready to harvest. And also maybe like interns that need to um, know where to go, they can just look at the map and it's really easy uh, for them to navigate. And also there's a task management um, option that helps you track all your da daily uh, farming tasks and it syncs up in one calendar. So, um, and it also generate reminders to the person that you assigned ta the task to. So it's really nice. Um, the person who is responsible of the task can have a reminder on her cell phone, his cell phone, and then uh, the person who maybe goes harvesting can time the harvest and also um, put in the yields, and then it can like generate reports, and it really help help us like it will help us refine our planning for next season. So there's a. Uh, Quick video of the tend. Oh, there's no sound. Well.
So yeah, if you have any other question, please, it's yeah, it's go, cheating. go <laughs> ask. How long have you been working with it? So we're going to start working what? with 10 uh, next Possibly. season. Okay. Yeah, it's not go going to be all of the uh, options in 10. It's like um, some options, but yeah, we're just going to transit uh, towards that. I, I put the um, price as TBD yeah. uh, because in the conversations that we were having from, with folks from 10, it seemed like it wasn't fully uh, solidified, Decided, yeah. so. Is there an okay, yeah. talk to us at the booth. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. But it's like, it's good. It's pretty affordable, so. Any more questions? <coughs> All right, so moving on. So game changers, so we saw a few of them. And, you know, crop planning, just to touch base on that, is, is really important considering that I don't know if everybody does it this way or if you're not that's I think that's how you should be doing it the, the, the reason why we're able to do what we do on this farm and this farm in the second year will be grossing five hundred and forty thousand dollars of sales and there's ten of us doing this okay so just to put perspective on this is that there's a lot of things moving and the only reason why we're able is because we've systemized a lot of the chores and the tasks we have good tools, but also the game plan was well thought about in the winter and then in the summer we're just following the game plan, making light changes, but we're not making big decisions in the summer because we're too busy. So, so 10, the reason why we're really excited about it is because it allows us to put all the information in one place and be able to sync all of it together really neatly. And so it's, we've, I've been helping these guys develop it with other growers and they're really open to input so all the new people that are coming in will help develop it even better which is really cool Excuse me, is that just on the eight, eight acre market farm only you're talking about? yeah okay. so you know these numbers are pretty impressive considering it's the second year of the farm um, and then i could go on about presenting you the washing station how efficient it is to streamline operation the greenhouses but we're going to stick to some of the field field tools and another one is the jank so I don't know if you guys are all using the Jang Cedar, but in my opinion, it's the best cedar out there. And I've been using it for a long time uh, with a lot of success because it singulates the seeds really well. It's versatile, it's rough. The soil doesn't need to be perfect like the six row cedar that we also use. The six row needs to have really well conditioned soil, but the Jang can take uh, more abuse and still be good. But, oh. So we don't have, the, 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 the trick here is now, now we're working with the triple yang cedar. And the triple makes us go three times faster. And when we're seeding, you know, 10 or 15 bed per week, 100 foot beds, we're saving about an hour, an hour, two hours work just by having it triple. So it's, it doesn't look like a lot, but if you boil down all of these little changes, efficiency, uh, do make a difference. And the, the price difference between this guy and the triple is about, we go from about $600 to $1,100. And I calculated that the, the time spent, uh, saved by using the triple, the payback for the tool was one season. And we'll be using it for 20, 25 seasons. So in my opinion, it's uh, definitely yeah, worthwhile. Good. Yeah. So I know it looks like Yeah. You're doing. So, is that a change in terms of your, what you've done? Over well, the last well, years? okay. So we it depends. And so now you're able to use this. So the we use, the bed prep on the farm is tarps, right. and then and then uh, harrow and rake. But if I don't need to rake, I won't rake. If I'm using the six row cedar, then I do need to rake, and spend more time. But what I'm teaching the people working on the farm is to do things as fast as possible, all the time, always. So and the so, debris road, do you, do you find you have a debris problem? No, I, I haven't had a debris problem. Okay. And, and again, it's really hard for me to tell this, but the way we work is all in systems. And so the reason why we have a harrow 
is because we want to have perfectly level condition bed because then it simplifies the usage of the cedars that we use. And the reason why we have tarps is because, so, so when I talk about how we do things, people need to understand that it's not just one tool, it's all the tools working together. And one of the tools, the better one out there to shave a lot of time in the field is the paper pot transplanter. And it's definitely not new. A lot of people have seen it in the past, uh, but it speeds up the operation of transplanting about, you know, 50 times. And, uh, you know, you're, we're taking all of the, all of the, the work is into the design of the papers, how they're folded in origami principle together. And then you're just unrolling it and then it's seeding uh, much faster than we can do it, uh, you know, two or three people on that bed. And so that's definitely one big game changer that it's out there. And so I was one of the first ones to use it many, many years ago. Now there's, there's a lot of people that are uh, working with the paper pot, making it better. Uh, Terra Tech in France is, is investing in that. Um, and then there's another company called paperpot.co. They're spending a lot of time researching it. They're going to Japan, finding solutions. And it's really awesome. The drawback with the paper pot is that it is not certified for organic production. In Canada, at least, it's been ruled out. So we don't use it on the farm. Um, What's the core of the, 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 the rationale? Because the paper has acetone, which is a chemical prohibited in organic certification, in the glue. Okay, And so they've specifically ruled it out. In Europe, it's been ruled out in many countries. In the US, it's variable. But in the US, they've allowed for hydroponics to be certified. So I, I don't really know what to think about all this anymore. Uh, I'm a big proponent of being certified because I think it's a very slippery slope when we decide to not take this into consideration because then you'll have the agronomist that's going to come to your farm and say, you have quack grass. Why don't you use Roundup to get rid of it? One time, you systematically get rid of your weeds, and then you're good to go. And then, so you're, you're doing that now. And then you'll have you know, a very specific fungal problem. And then the agronomist or the, your, you know, your peer group will tell, well, we use this pesticide or this fungicide that really will make the difference, but it's not certified. And you're using it. And then, you see what I mean? It's kind of a slippery slope. So that's why I've. I'm very confused about what's going to happen with, with, with organic certification here in the U.S. Question. Yes. Um, the tarping. Um, yes. Do you, do you run into any problems with mold? No. And mold is not a bad thing in your garden because the fungi elements are really important. You want to have also the shrooms that are there because they do end up fixing a lot of the things for the root systems. So whenever I see white stuff in my beds because I tarp, I'm, I'm happy about it. It's not a problem. We actually put ramule wood chip, which is linen, into the, into the bed to create the fungi element and to bring it back. So uh, this rounds up five tools that are making a difference in this uh, farm project. And those five tools can be scaled down or they could be scaled up but they do make a big difference in our weekly chores. And so I think there's a value in that. You have all the information on the sheets. We'll be there to discuss more if you have questions. And Elliot has a question. Yeah, about the paper pot transplant. Let's say uh, this paper's only 50. Yeah. Uh, what when we were pioneering organic farming years ago, nobody was very nice and nobody was helping us out, but it didn't make any difference. Mm. Uh, the most universal system of agriculture is one that depends on compost, right? In your backyard, it's a tree from waste product, and all the other things. So we were very careful not to have any pieces in there where some supplier could say, I'm sorry, your system can't work anymore. And the thing that makes me nervous about the paper pot transplanter is hooking my whole farm to transplanting with this thing where some guy can stop selling or give them the price because I've limited that 
that may be just an old organic hippie suspicion, but the nice thing about the soil blocks is they're free. That's a great point, Elliot, and I think it's, uh, it's uh, important to be aware of it. There's definitely a repeat business in the paper pot, and that's why a lot of people are, you know, wanting to sell the paper pots because they know that you'll be buying from them. But yeah, and so we don't use it because it's not certified. Um, the counterpoint to that, I would say, though, is that it's if it saves us 15 hours of work per week, there's a, there's a cost to that too. So each his own. We find our balances. Yep. Um, at the new farm, do you have a tractor? The new farm has a tractor to bring compost to the beds. And are you buying? Are you still buying compost, or are you making? Your we're own? this is this is the second year, and this year we're making compost because now the barns are ready for the cows and the pigs. Uh, we bought compost, put a lot of it down, and put ramule wood chips. Uh, I have another presentation on living soils. I could show you that, um, but you know this is. This is 450 permabets, so this is, the tractor is good for that. But besides that, I'm still not sold on tractors. <laughs> and uh, I might be stubborn, but I, when I'm thinking that we'll be making, next year we're aiming to, ma to make $700,000 of sales, the 11 of us, because I'm going to be on the crew more, Without a tractor, I'm, I'm wondering, is the tractor, because the tractor seems to be always the focal point on some farms. Everything revolves around the tractor. And in my mind, well, how about the washing station? How about the crop planning? How about weed prevention? You know, because your focus becomes the element of success on your farm. And sometimes I wonder if tractors take up too much space on farms. But I don't want to get into a fight about this. This is just my perspective. Um, but we're definitely showing that you can be highly, highly productive and efficient without a tractor. Yes? What model BCS do you uh, we, I think now they've changed. We, it used to be the 853. Now the 749 or 42 has a different clutch systems that is, that is safer and better. Uh, pretty typical. BCS knows what you need. They've, they've, they're selling, there's, you know, there's thousands of people now doing market gardens in the U.S. So the, 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 the thing is coming alive. And it's, it's good because if you're doing direct sale, if you're doing CSA, if you're doing farmer's market, if you're keeping your production at a proximity level, i.e. you're not wholesaling, um, you know, these kind of systems that we're showing you, just, they just work perfect for that. That's really where the market garden becomes powerful because you don't need to grow volumes. You're not capitalizing on economies of scale. You're scaling things down. You're keeping costs to the minimum, but you're direct selling everything and creating relationships with your clients. Like on my home farm that I showed you, we have 200, 250 clients. That's it. But my wife this year, by keeping it simple, because I'm not there on the farm anymore, so she, she, all these experiments are not running anymore. Uh, she, her sales are 165,000, and she's uh, netting half of it in her pocket. And in an uncomplicated system, she has four months off. So anybody that tries to convince me that this doesn't work, uh, I, I think otherwise. But this is not where you want to feed the world. This is to feed your community. That's just my. How many people does if, she have at her house? She she has four people, including her, working on the farm. But you know that's a farm that's 15 years in the making. But still, you know these these are interesting numbers for, for farming. So. Are they Canadian or US dollars? <laughs> Oops. Are you, are you telling us Canadian or US dollars? Uh, these are Canadian dollars, but it's the same thing. And depending on where you are, prices will be higher or lower. Uh, if I was. Like my friend Connor at Neversync, with the prices he sells everything, we'd be rolling in Mercedes coming down to this conference. <laughs> For real. But uh, we don't get those prices in Montreal. Yes? Uh, two questions. Uh, I guess based on what you know now, uh, you're starting, what's the best and easiest way to make the permanent beds? Yeah, so there's a couple of options there. Uh, depending on how many you need to make and how fast this needs to happen, if it's an overnight kind of thing, uh, you know, it's going to involve a lot of 
tilling and rotor tilling and trying to destroy the sod. If you have more time, the easiest is just to, you know, shape the beds, perhaps even go with a backhoe. And then, you know, we, we, what we did on this farm, the most efficient way we found, because there were so many of them, so we rented a backhoe and it had an 18 inch bucket, which is the size of our pathways. And then we would just scoop out the aisle and put it onto the bed, raising our beds that way. Everything was super straight. And then we tarped everything and then we let the earthworms kind of digest everything, creating healthy soils this way. And then we put ramule wood chips in the aisles. And we were making, I think it was 10, 10 beds per hour this way from sod. But if you have the time, then, you know, you could have somebody come and plow and disc, and then you have loose material. Then you can use shovels, you can use a, a bertha plow, and, and shape your beds that way. So there's a lot of videos online if you Google my work, how to make beds, you'll see how we do it with the BCS. And then I guess my second question is, I noticed that with this picture, everything is mostly going this way, but you have a couple beds going up and down. <coughs> what was the thought process behind uh, there's th That's the whole permaculture principle here at work, is that the drainage on these, the slope is facing south, and so the beds are all facing south, down slope, so then the extra water gets channeled away. And... Um, blue screen and then so the water there's a ridge here so the water gets channeled here into these ditches these dry creeks and then they filter the water that goes into these ponds on both sides so this creates habitats for frogs and toads and and snakes which we want because they eat the mice and the voles and um, and it filters the water so there, there's been a lot of things happening here, but this was all created on paper first. And then we set out to just make it, and each field block has its own set of, of tarps, and then there's flowering hedgerows that are uh, dividing each of the field blocks. So it's harder for some insects to migrate from one to the, to the other. They're acting as windbreaks, and the, the, we don't see them, and we, I don't have a picture of it, but. They're all shrubs and plants that were selected, selected because they attract either beneficial insects or predatory insects that will uh, eat some of the insects that are problematic in our garden. So there was, I gave the designers that, that researched that a list of 10 insects that were problematic in our area, and then they researched which insects can counteract those ones and then once they had that list of insects, they looked at the habitats for all of those. And then we built gills that we planted here. And so and then we're measuring this the last two years. And then hopefully in five or six years, we might know if we've created a system that is self-sustaining. And you know, so these are kind of experiments that we're running on this farm. It's kind of higher level kind of stuff. But we have the financial backing to do some of that. And it's exciting. So. That's it for me. I think time's up. They've talked about the master class. This will be launched uh, next week. If you guys are interested, there's a lot of value into it. You can check it out online. And if you have questions about this farm and what we're doing, we'll be here today. And uh, just let's, let's talk. Thank you. <laughs>